uh, I would like to tell you briefly how I came to uh, blockchain DLT research. And when I'm saying blockchain, I mean all kinds of distributed ledgers. It was a couple of years ago, of course, the first time I heard about Bitcoin, that was quite a while ago, maybe 2012, 2013. Then I integrated it into my teaching. And around 2015, I, I noticed the bigger potential. And at that time, hardly anyone was doing research outside con computer science and cryptography. So my home base, so to speak, is information systems. And I thought I figured out a, a, a blue ocean, so to say, where nobody else is doing research. And of course, th that turned out to be a big misconception, but it doesn't matter because it's really exciting now to be in a field where so much going on. And I'm mainly a researcher at Modul University Vienna, but I'm also an associate at the UCL Center of Blockchain Technologies in London. And uh, right at the moment, I'm working in the uh, working group blockchain for cities of the UN, um, U4SSC, which is an initiative of the ITU, the International Telecommunications Association, and um, the, the United Nations. All of these activities you can see here, including the city of blockchain, where I get in contact with the industry, uh, they, are, they are not paid. I'm just doing this out of interest. And I also want to make an, some kind of impact. One of the good things about being a university professor is that I can choose my own research topics. And here at Module University, we have a focus on sustainability. And so it came quite natural that I was connecting those two topics, uh, blockchain and sustainability. And Yesterday, I just did out of interest a short search on Google Trends, and I figured out that when it comes to sustainability goals, the uh, 17 goals, I guess you all know, then there's a huge uh, difference in, in interest all over the world. So I did a, search, a quick search on Google Trends, and I found that uh, the lighter areas here, there's more interest, and it seems that outside of Europe, interest in those goals is kind of uh, less. Um, yeah. Here we have the 17 goals and I think it's good that they included so many different areas and so many different aspects. On the other hand, for me as a researcher, it makes it really hard to draw any borders because of, if you look at it, it's really hard to find any kind of application, let alone blockchain application that does not have um, any kind of impact in one of those fields. So if you're doing something in supply chain management, of course, you can always claim to, uh, it has to do with, with hunger. If you're doing uh, research in the food supply chain or if you're creating solutions in the food supply chain, and most cases you will have some economic impact or impact on the industry innovation infrastructure. So th that's a little bit tough, but on the other hand, it's also good that all kind of positive impact is included. and. I would like to start with uh, some kind of definition. Most likely that's one you all know. So what's uh, sustainable development? It's some kind of development where you take into account what needs we have right at the moment. And if I'm saying we, I'm talking about mankind or humankind uh, in general, without compromising any uh, needs of future generations. And this was, I think, created by the Brundtland Commission more than 30 30 years ago. And uh, I'm not sure how much you know about sustainability. I know everybody in this uh, conference and uh, most likely has uh, some knowledge about blockchain. So I included some different kinds of sustainability. I'm having a brief look at the chat. Um, so I, I got a question, the conflict between sustainability and growth. Um, yeah, I think what I'm going to do, I'm going to collect uh, collecting all these uh, questions and I'll, I'll do my best to answer them in the end. I guess I need about 20, 25 minutes and then we can discuss these issues. And if there is not enough time, I'm happy to uh, open a chat room. Yeah, uh, what you can see here, uh, sustainability is more than just uh, the environment. It has also to do with the economy because we need to live out of something. And of course, also society, if we have some social issues that will impact of course, also the environment, because then we are depleting our resources even more. And um, basically two different approaches came out of that. And one is called the weak sustainability approach and the other one is strong sustainability. Talking about weak sustainability in a nutshell means that you can kind of substitute one for the other. So 
sometimes you hear about adjusted net savings, meaning you have your GDP and then you subtract costs, uh, for example, for capital depreciation, resource depletion. So you put it all in one basket and then you're deducting some kind of money for societal issues, environmental issues, and so on. And the other approach would be strong sustainability, meaning that at the outer court, uh, at the outer ring is all about the environment. So if you don't have a fully functioning environment, then you might have some issues, of course, with society and in the end you have the economy. But um, having a perfectly functioning economy without having a functioning society or in the first place, a fully functioning environment is not possible. If you want to know about my perspective, then uh, I would consider myself to be here. Uh, my view is, uh, honestly, is that strong sustainability view. And of course, there are some um, nuances in between, but I'm not sure if you know the work of Ceausescu Rogan, and now we're going back in the 1970s. And I would encourage you to read his paper, Energy and Economic Myths, where he's basically debunking the idea of a fully circular economy where you can substitute one for the other or we, where you can recycle uh, at infinitum, meaning you will always use more energy even if you recycle than you had um, in the beginning. And uh, you just need to think about rare earth, or all these kind of uh, natural resources, no matter how much you recycle, you will lose some resources in the process. And that's one issue we have to face as mankind. And he is also making a point that uh, the only resource we have in abundance is our solar energy. So I strongly recommend you to read his papers. Of course, you don't need to necessarily agree with me. I would be absolutely interested in discussing these things with you and um, yeah, um, I can. I think I can briefly address um, the question related to growth. Uh, the, the question is, it seems that the SDG goals do not recognize growth is not required for sustainability. Uh, they do, oh, here we have two, negotiation, uh, two negations in here, not recognize that growth is not required. Yes, um, I, I, I would see it. Uh, I'm basically, I'm in the tradition now of degrowth, mankind or humankind, better word, we need to figure out a way to uh, survive without having sustained growth because any great kind of growth where we have growth rates is kind of exponential. But again, we can discuss this after I'm finished. So my idea as a researcher is I want to see solutions that could not have been done without blockchain or DLT technologies. And at the moment, I'm not looking for the perfect solution. I just want to see incremental solutions because when I started in this space a couple of years ago, I could see it's always the, uh, some kind of binary approach. Either you have something that's perfect or uh, the solution in a way uh, is worthless. And I think we are a little bit too impatient. And even today, I have seen so many great ideas. Just the last presentation was absolutely wonderful when it comes to sustainability and it's also inspiring what the what's going on in the other chat room when they are talking about more technical issues or privacy issues and we all need to combine these things and to create solutions which which can improve the way uh, we live today and i would also like to quantify the positive impact and that's a tricky part because as i've said in the beginning it's always hard to claim that you can do something better but it's really make to hard to, uh, to quantify these claims and sometimes the goals are kind of conflicting and in these cases we talk about externalities so uh, an externality would be some kind of side effect and those could be positive or negative negative. and um, for those of you who are interested more in the initiatives that are being done by the international telecommunications union and the united nations the one i'm active in is called a uh, blockchain for cities and that's a work group that's part of the U4 SEC. And the goal of this initiative is to find sol or identify solutions that can help to make uh, cities better, better places to live in. And uh, of course, it's called blockchain for cities. So the main goal is that it has some kind of blockchain DLT technology on which the solution is based. Uh, I included the link down here. So if you are interested, you can check out this page. And I'm just telling you that this is something that's open for 
anyone who has an interest in that space and who has some kind of experience. In other words, if you would be interested in participating yourself in the next work group, then you can sign up and you can contribute. They're always looking for experts and uh, again, it's, it's not paid. And for this specific work group, the uh, report is coming out, I think in the next weeks or month. It has not been published yet, but we're in the final stages. And our goals in this work group were uh, to find some use cases and practical experience and to describe and document them. And I can tell you in advance, that was the hardest part because there are so many great ideas out there, but not too many fully functioning solutions that have some kind of, let's say, business case and that really use blockchain technology in a way that they have a solid governance model and all those other things we have discussed today. And uh, we also, had uh, the goal to develop a concept, conceptual framework to assess these solutions. And we finally need to come up with some policy recommendations because we actually uh, don't want to see this as an academic exercise. And um, yeah, and we want to also give some indications for the politicians. I'm just checking the check. Um, yes, uh, I'm going to share all the slides. I'm sorry if they are hard to read, most likely then uh, screen resolution is not good enough, but uh, I will do my best on the other slides there. Um, I think the font size is a little bit bigger. And of course you can have all the slides after my presentation if you like. Yeah, that was our initial framework just to see how we got started. And I guess my presentation today is on the highest level, so to speak, of all, pres of all presentations that I've also heard in the screen. I have been following it for a couple of hours now. And uh, the idea was just to classify solutions and to see what good they can do. And when it comes to blockchain and cities, we had a couple of urban challenges. First of all, there was the environment, but also mobility. We were especially considering if we can make cities a more livable place by, for example, reducing traffic, then some kind of societal changes. I think of uh, voting over blockchain governance issues, and finally, everything that can improve safety and security for citizens. And um, in our framework, we had the following structure. We were looking for blockchain or alternative solutions that were used at the infrastructure layer. So our selection criteria quite naturally was, uh, was some kind of blockchain solution applied. And we didn't differentiate, by the way, between public, private, permission, permissionless. Then we uh, also describe what kind of solution, uh, which kind of solution and what kind of requirements were considered, how it was implemented and what kind of benefits came out of that. And I told you in the beginning, we found a couple of nice solutions, but many of them at a very early stage. A, a different evaluation framework, which I came up last year, and I, I think that something like that would provide a good, uh, great, a good starting point for classifying uh, sustainability solutions using blockchain. My idea was to look at different kinds of industries and uh, use the triple bottom line, meaning environment, society and economy to figure out what blockchain can do in specific industries for the three different aspects of sustainability. And I'm not going through all of these uh, examples now. I'm just giving you some ideas what I've Um, it seems that we've lost Horst. Yeah, let's let's try and wait a minute until we contact him and see if he can rejoin the presentation. Let me see what I can do. Please stay tuned and we will try to get Horst back.
In the meantime, while we're wait, waiting, would anyone like to start a discussion um, between the participants here? Or maybe address something that you um, didn't have the chance to address during the day? Well, I'm assuming that we all have something to say about blockchain and sustainability if we're here. I mean, I think one of the things that comes up for me, and maybe people have ideas about this, is just when we talk about blockchain and sustainability, it almost kind of bothers you to think about proof of work, right? Here we are burning up the environment with our proof of work protocols and talking about sustainability. So I was wondering if anybody here um, has something to say about that. So we actually have I didn't actually uh, get to introduce myself today. I'm also working at the Research Institute for Crypto Economics at the Vienna University of Business Econom and Economics together with, together with Chris, Jacob, Sherman, and so on. And we actually have posted a few um, um, articles on this topic that actually proof of work. Uh, of course, it's very much energy consuming. And of course, this is not the solution. And, and it wasn't the intention to create something like this. But um, um, the research shows that a, a very large part of the energy consumed is actually being um, uh, mined sustainably, so to say, is coming from the sustainable resources. And again, I say this is not a solution. We are definitely not, we are not supposed to be creating um, mechanisms that are actually that much energy consuming. But um, uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, a lot of that energy actually comes from, from uh, sustainable resources. Uh, we can definitely discuss this. This is a very good point. Um, and uh, let's see what, what Horst um, uh, has. Uh, yeah, I, I'm back. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, fine. Uh, so I, I had some technical issues, apparently. I, I guess I was talking to my computer screen. Um, I just heard uh, proof of work. I agree, that's a big issue. I, I didn't include it in my PowerPoint slides because I think that would be a topic on its own. And mm -hmm. proof of work and energy consumption, I mean, that, that's really uh, connected to this kind of uh, consensus mechanism. And many of the blockchain solutions I found out there um, that are interesting for sustainability are not necessarily public solutions. And uh, some people might claim that oh, if they're not public, they are not blockchains. And this more like a philosophical discussion. And, and I think it was Tatiana or whoever mentioned that before. Uh, yeah, uh, the, the, the thing is with um, proof of work, when you talk, for example, about Bitcoin, a lot of that energy comes from uh, sustainable uh, resources or um, so you also need to take that into account. And another issue is you also need to take into account what the current monetary system uh, consumes uh, when it comes to energy. And, and that's really highly complicated. I actually put together some ideas for a paper in which I contrast all these opinions, but I didn't include this in my presentation today on purpose. But of course, this is also something that I would consider a negative external externality and that if you're doing a total cost analysis that needs to be taken into account, you cannot say you create a system and that, I don't know, improves food safety and is completely sustainable. And then you're using a very energy consuming uh, proof of work mechanism and you say it's all good. It's definitely an, an issue. Yeah, may I just refer while we're uh, on the point, we actually had a bachelor student who wrote his bachelor thesis on this topic and he tried to compare uh, the energy consumption of a Bitcoin transaction to a, a energy consumption of a traditional transaction, so to say, so MasterCard, uh, Visa or even cash transactions. Uh, that we have now. So he tried to do this. We have we've published the the bachelor thesis uh, on our website. Please take a look at it. Um, sh shortly or, or or to to summarize, it is very hard to actually calculate the CO two consumption uh, in the traditional banking sector. It is almost impossible and you use the life cycle assessment method uh, there are different approaches but um yeah as i said you can you can find this special thesis on our uh, website and all the other articles that we posted to this topic you can find uh, on the website unblocked that uh, is a sustainability initiative of the institute thank you course for uh, yeah. quick coming back to us and please do continue yeah. the presentation. I, I, i'm back um thank you tatiana can you hear me 
Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay, good. And and you can see my screen, right? Yes. You can you can see my screen, huh? Yes, yes, we do. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, actually, I think I even know the bachelor thesis, and um, I, I can highly recommend it. There's also a lot of good work from Hass McCook, and it might also be a good idea for you to check out some some talks from Andreas Antonopoulos on the subject. Mm -hmm. But a, again, all in all, I don't think wasting energy for uh, for mining Bitcoin is good by itself, but we also need to take into account what we can get out of that. And of course, for me, it would be much nicer to have some kind of solution that's not wasting energy. But just to give an example, how poorly pe many people understand the system. A couple of years ago, there was uh, a couple of blogs around telling you that in the year 2020, the whole world will run out of energy because of Bitcoin mining, because they just extrapolated uh, the exponential growth curve. and. So th this is something that's definite, definitely a negative externality. And here I have an example of in general blockchain based incentive systems, which uh, I took from a colleague of mine, Markus Dub, who is currently in Switzerland and he published a, a chapter and a book that I edited. And uh, the basic schema is very straightforward. You have some uh, negative externalities and they have positive externalities from what you're doing, some negative and positive side effects and the question is, can you uh, identify any kind of incentives and can you make them tradable, for example, by using tokens? And of course, the uh, third and final question is, if you have a system uh, which is exactly doing that, how can you measure if it's working? And yeah, we heard Shamin today and uh, she did a quite a, quite a substantial uh, amount of research on that subject. I'm just, just giving you uh, one example on the next slide. Um, yeah, and, and one thing we also need in a system like that, we need some kind of oracle uh, feeding in information from the environment. It can be either done by humans or it can be done by sensors just to understand if we really achieved our goals. And the one example I'm giving you is just the one Markus Dupp is uh, discussing in his paper. And Honestly speaking, I, I like this example a lot, but I don't know the latest, uh, the, uh, the latest, um, so, so the, how it looks at the moment. Uh, there was a project of cleaning the river Niger, and the idea was to give micro payments to community members to do that because that river was spilled with oil and this has been going on for decades and nothing they ever tried to clean it up really worked. And so they were trying micro payments because this is fairly easy to handle. And the idea was to get the community started. Last week, I had a talk with somebody from supply chain management, and they want to uh, use a system like that to monitor how funding is being used, actually. So, you know, all those funding opportunities, they go somewhere and the money is basically uh, given to someone to do something. But in very many cases, it's not clear how the money is being spent. And so this is actually one way to figure that out. But all of the projects I know are at a fairly early stage and it's really hard to assess them. So if you have any any updated news, let me know. Uh, yeah, we already heard about Eleanor Ostrom and I know there are other researchers also in this field, but I have to say a couple of years ago, I had a nice idea. I thought, what if we use blockchain technology and what we can do with it? For example, tokenization, self-enforcement. Here we have smart contracts. We have even DAOs. And uh, take eight, the eight principles from Eleanor Ostrom. And for those of you who do not know her, she did a lot of groundbreaking research when it comes to the self-governing of communities. And she got what is called the Nobel Prize in Economics. And my idea was to combine the features of blockchain with the principles of, of Ostrom and just see if we can put it to use. But I have to say, before I started doing that, I did some research and I found others were faster than I was. And so I need to give credits to them. And this is just another example I can show you um, that's already been um, under development. And my colleagues, um, Daniel Rosas and others, they got a grant for that and they are developing solutions in which blockchain technology help uh, communities actually to self-govern themselves, uh, to govern themselves. How can this work? I give you two examples. For example, you can use a token to create community boundaries. And we have heard a lot about token today. I assume you're familiar with that. And so you just create something for 
within a community to just create some incentive structures. So this could be done. You can create self-enforcement mechanisms and you can formalize them by and, and by doing that, you can fix the rules to local needs. You create some kind of code, smart contracts, doesn't matter how you want to call them. And in those codes, you bake the rules of the community. And what my colleagues also did, they were checking out all these other options of blockchain or distributed ledger technology to uh, actually implement the rules of Astrom. And once more, uh, this is research in progress. I think this is absolutely great wonderful ideas what they're doing but um, we also need to take into account that it might take a couple of years because uh, before we see all these projects really um, being implemented so um, how much more time do we have I think uh, 10 more minutes is this correct uh, Tatiana um, can Yes, so the next speaker is scheduled for 7 p.m. and we, we would like to have like a 10 minutes uh, for Q&A. Okay, so I, I, I'll do my best to finish in 10 minutes. Uh, I give you uh, just some more examples and then I, I can tell you if you like to reach out to the community if you want to participate uh, with the United Nations where you can find us. Um, another example I'm using quite often is Frycoin. I'm not sure if you know this person here. His name is Silvio Gesell. He lived around the turn of the previous centuries, around 1900, 1860, 1930, something like that. And he came up with something that's quite interesting, some kind of demurrage currency. Currency that uh, uses, uh, that loses value if you don't spend it. And if this rings a bell, um, yeah, because it was quite famous, for example, in the uh, area of depression, 1930s, this was tried out in some countries, for example, Austria. So there was the Great Depression in Austria and a um, huge amount of unemployment. The monetary system was not working and there was a small community in Tyrell that was using that kind of money. Of course, it was on paper and uh, they got stamps in this money and if they didn't spend it, then it was, would lose value. And so they could create a safe haven within Tyrell uh, where they had a, a really flourishing economy. But the whole experiment was stopped by the Austrian National Bank because they didn't want anyone to mess around with the currency. And what I found very interesting, there was some developers and I was in contact with one of them, Mark Friedenbach, uh, that developed something like that. It's called Frycoin. If you go to CoinMarketCap, you will see it's not much in circulation. There's not much going on when it comes to trading. But uh, just to give you my philosophy, that's not really important for me at the moment. It's just we have some kind of economic concept and now we have the technical means to implement it. Most likely it will take a couple of years before we have those solutions that will be sustainable in a way. But it's absolutely fascinating for me to see that now it is we can use technology to try out those economic experiments. Might not be so interesting for us today in Europe, let's say, but we have many countries that uh, even at the moment suffer from high inflation. Yeah, uh, one of my uh, research examples, for a couple of years, I was active in um, a working group of the European Union called ELIS, Alliance for Logistics Innovation Through Collaboration in Europe. And the idea of this initiative is to create more effective and efficient supply chains. And this one is called uh, the physical internet. That's the name of the concept. And it has nothing to do with the internet, uh, as you might know it, the digital internet. It's a supply chain concept in which the packages that you ship are treated like data packages on the internet. So it also has a layered approach. And at the lowest level, you have modular containers. Then we have uh, ideas to optimize the usage of uh, vehicles and so on and so on. And the interesting thing is about the supply chain concept. If you combine it with blockchain technology, you can basically use uh, distributed ledgers to optimize two of three flows here. Not the physical flow, which is basically the, the parcels, but the information flow and all the payments flows. So the whole thing has a huge amount of potential, but again, it's very much conceptual. People working on parts of it, I'm in a couple of research projects, but in order to implement the fully working system, there are many, many things we need to consider. And I uh, joined this uh, group a couple of hours ago, and there was some discussion also about legal issues. And when it comes to a supply chain that's governed by 
let's say blockchain for these kind of flows, I would say the legal issues are maybe the bigger problem as compared to some kind of, of blockchain infrastructure. I think the technology is a little bit more advanced than uh, legal issues in this one here. And another big problem could be corporation models. So the, the business layer, if you like. So even if you can do it on a technical layer, even if you can find a blockchain solution to account for, let's say, micropayments, we still have the issue that companies in the transportation sector do not want to cooperate with each other. So it's highly interesting. And again, uh, if we could manage something like that to make our supply chains more efficient and more smoothly, we could save a lot of energy. We could save a lot of, of exhaust fumes and we can provide so much value to the industry because a lot of food also gets wasted because the transportation time is too long. So I think I'm going to skip this slide uh, just to make it in time. I wanted to point out for you this uh, forthcoming report on blockchain for cities. First of all, if you're interested in the report, please go to the webpage. I assume that in two or three months it will be uh, ready. And once more, if you are interested in participating in one of these projects, you just need to sign up like I did. Especially interesting for you if you are actively doing research or if you're working in this area. And what we did, again, we found some use cases and that was the hard part, I can tell you, because our main criterion was that it should be something that's up and running but we found some solutions for democracy and decision-making. This is one of the use cases I could contribute from Italy. Um, then identity voting, certification, all of those applications you know, and all of them providing something to make the communities a little bit better in different areas like uh, mobility or environment. And so my conclusion is, and I just gave you a couple of cases on a very high level, first of all, to answer my question from the first slide, is it overhyped or undervalued? I would say it's probably both at the moment. Uh, many solutions out there claim to have some kind of sustainability impact, but they do not exactly specify what kind of negative externalities you have. And we had the proof of work discussion before. Uh, of course, you can claim you provide financial inclusion with Bitcoin and you don't mention the amount of energy that is burned. So it's very important to um, at the same time, take everything into account. And it is undervalued in a way that we have so many potential uh, opportunities out there and we all need to explore them. So I'm not one of those who is saying just because that, um, a certain solution at the moment is not making any money, then it's, it's bad. We just need to give it more time and we need to keep on doing our work. Uh, second problem for me is that sustainability is such a broad and fussy concept. I've shown in the beginning and it's so easy to come up with uh, claims that your solution is sustainable just because you pick one of the 17 goals and then uh, you say, I fit into this goal and so I provided a nice sustainability solution. Yeah, and uh, the applications that are built on an infrastructure can never be more advanced than the inf infrastructure itself. And that's the huge problem with blockchain DLT. There's so much going on on a technological level and if the underlying technology is in a state of flux, of course, the, all the uh, applications that are built on it. So I expect much more to see in the coming years. And we need some quantitative assessment frameworks, which take into account the positive and negative side effects and come up with some kind of uh, objective assessment if a solution is really sustainable. We need a repository of use cases. Again, that's what we started in the UN project, but I think we can do much better than that and create big repositories in which we really bundle use cases that are out there and give them some kind of assessment and make them open uh, to the public. And those, of course, should be more than white papers. And in order to do so, we need some independent assessors. And this would also be a place where universities come in, but also non-governmental uh, organizations or any others you can think of. And once more, externalities need to, to be considered, all of them. So if you have a positive impact on one sustainability goal, but a negative impact on another, uh, that should be weighed against each other. And again, I see some kind of premature assessments in many cases, so people are just claiming that a certain solution is not viable at the moment because for some reason it has some technical issues. So we need to be patient, but we also need to be critical. And all in all, I'm quite 
positive because I see so many smart people working out there and a lot of what I've heard today in both uh, streams is highly encouraging once more for me to continue doing my research and I expect a lot of technological process in the years to come and hopefully it's for the better for all of us. So I'm going to stop here, here contact. I'm perfectly fine with sharing my slides and I'm looking forward to the 10 minutes of discussion we have now. And if uh, we need more time, I can always join you in some channel out there. So I'm unsharing my screen. Tatiana, are you still here? Yes, thank you very much for your oh, presentation. Okay, thank you. I was a little bit rushed in the end, but... Uh, no, it was, it oh, was uh, perfect. And um, I cannot agree more. We are, we are kind of working on similar things at the Vienna University of Business and Economics. And we have also been trying to, to develop an evaluation framework because we've been seeing uh, so many sustainability projects that are not actually doing anything for sustainability. So I, I really must agree with everything that you've mm -hmm. said and would uh, like to open uh, the discussions right away. So uh, would anyone yeah. like to raise a hand? I don't have any other questions in uh, the uh, 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 yeah we have some comments in the chat actually mm -hmm. right from the beginning if you uh, if you give me a second i can read them out loud or you can see them the first one is from grace um i'm interested in the conflict between sustainability and growth we are now realizing that we grow yeah we grow and we cause damage to the environment i couldn't agree anymore uh and she says, uh, do not recognize that growth is not required meant for sustainability. Yes. Uh, so I'm not sure if Grace, if, if you're still here, but um, I would fully agree with you. Actually, we cannot grow forever. And um, actually at my university, there are some colleagues of mine who are doing research on degrowth, which means we need to shrink in a way, we need to shrink our economies in order to survive. And that's fully what, what I think. I'm, I'm just checking other comments. Uh, oh yeah, there's, you posted uh, the, the, the bachelor thesis and once more, I think I know it and I can highly recommend it. And in the end, I can see a comment uh, from Dave saying um, he implemented a demo in the token back in 2017. Yeah, great, great ideas. I always like it if you take something that's so innovative and uh, really groundbreaking. And then you, 100 years ago after uh, Silvio Gesell had these nice ideas and they were shown that they can work in some settings and somebody comes along and implements something like that. And actually I'm not aware of any, any um, big um, usage of these tokens, but I'm still so impressed that they exist and maybe we need them in the future. So are you still here? Can you hear me? Any other questions? Anyone would, wants to? Would anyone like to start uh, another discussion or raise a hand and pose a question here? Yeah, Grace, go ahead. Thank you for your questions. I'd I'd kind of like to follow on from my question because you are you're involved with the UN. Like when you talk to them about degrowth, um, you know, how does that go? Because I think we're seeing something very interesting now. Like all of a sudden, everybody's slowing down, but we're all a lot happier in some ways, more calm, you know? So there's all these externalities that we don't even know that, that you know, that are happening. Yeah, uh, when you're saying I'm, I'm involved with the UN, it's on a very small level, you know? Um, the one U4 SSC is, is part, of a, uh, part of the UN, and then I'm working in one sub-project, uh, which is Blockchain for Cities, and which is mainly organized by the uh, United Nations University. Uh, so I'm basically working together with a couple of researchers and not talking to a UN secretary or someone like that. So it's the impact is that big and I'm really focusing on blockchain activities. So uh, we in this working group, we did not really discuss degrowth. That's uh, out of the scope and uh, would be really interesting, but my impact is not that, that big, I have to admit that. Okay, thank you. Would anyone else like to ask a question? Yeah. And one more thing I would like to add, it's really cool that we have this online conference because I'm also cutting down on conferences a lot and I like uh, when I don't have to fly. So it's, it's really great how things are working and how the technology works and, and that's also, I think, a, a good contribution. Yeah, totally. 
Um, I would have a question while, uh, if there are no questions from the audience, I will pose the one. So you've been talking about the evaluation framework that you that you uh, composed and that you've been looking for uh, city um, initiatives, so to say. Uh, have you ran any of the initiatives through the evaluation framework? And if you have, did you take a look at the uh, culture token of Vienna that, that we almost long uh, less uh, yeah. yeah you know uh, uh, when uh, when Shamin mentioned the culture token I, I suddenly memorized it and I know the culture token can be used to save co2 so that even would I think would qualify as a potential case but I'm not sure how how is it, is it implemented already so can you use the culture token is it up and running so we launched the test phase in February and um, the research on our side um, um, is done for, for the test phase and we, we actually launched the test phase, but it didn't last much uh, because of the uh, whole COVID uh, crisis. So it is now <laughs> officially, it has stopped, but uh, of course we are uh, working on it um, with, with the city of Vienna and are trying to better it. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that's what we experienced. We have so many great ideas, but at the end of the day, we were discussing, oh, so fine, what is already up and running, what is implemented? And I, I guess the culture token is in an early phase, so it doesn't qualify as a, as a solution that's already contributing a lot, but I think it's such a great idea that if you can manage to build this thing and that people adopt it, then uh, it definitely would qualify as a sustainability solution if you can make people really, let's say, uh, using the cars a little bit less, and then you need to uh, quantify the impact. But the idea is wonderful. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Maybe uh, for the last two minutes that we have another question for from anyone else. Would anyone else like to write, raise a hand? If not, I would uh, be interesting to he interested to hear uh, what team is working on these kinds of uh, evaluation frameworks. So you have the, the tech people, blockchain people, uh, sustainability people. Who is working on these? Oh, go good question. So I, I have to be careful what I say because I'm not sure if, if I know the exact numbers. But usually we do online meetings. Um, I mean, we do only online meetings to be specific. And normally I would say 25 to 30 people are joining those meetings. And most of them are contributing to the report, some more, some less. And I would say we have all kind of experts in the, um, in the pool. We have a couple of academics, uh, quite a few practitioners, and um, also a couple of computer scientists. For the moment, it's hard to me uh, to specify how many of of us have more of a technological perspective and how many are more into economics, but I think we have a good mix of all of them. And uh, it's, it's important that uh, you get different views and um, we have quite a couple of discussions going on in order to find what topics are relevant for us. And most of the work is then done um, individually. So we have an open document and we can post comments and, and all of that. But again, it's very important that you have um, qualifications that are that cover a broad range. I, I'm not sure if we have any lawyers in the team. I, I need to check that, but uh, it's not only academics or not only practitioners, but uh, we need everything, including computer scientists. But as Shamin was saying in her talk, um, it's also important that you don't have on, only computer science because you also need some kind of economic expertise and uh, maybe even sociologists. So to include everything. Yeah, yeah, exactly.